So I am uh, Maria, uh, an artist based in Lithuania. And uh, my background is that I started in contemporary dance uh, and then shifted to, to clown. And then it was a big uh, clash for me between contemporary arts and the clown work. So I call myself now conceptual clown. Um, and uh, yes, and now I'm fresh mom as well. And um, I'm Andrea Salustri. I started as a street artist. Then I transitioned to philosophy and then dance and choreography. I was supported by Circus Next as a laureate in 2019. I created a couple of works and now I'm doing object manipulations. So you will hear a philosopher and a clown uh, talking about sustainability. But you don't know which one is which. Um, so we're here today to talk about sustainability in more than human circus. What is that? It's that that we both, with Andrea, we are, uh, I don't know if we are obsessed or just uh, normally interested into uh, rethinking relationship with uh, uh, non-humans. So both of us objects and now I expanded also to rethinking relationship to animals in circus and arts. Yes, maybe then we touch also what is an object, if there are human and non-human objects and what else is to be defined and identified as an object. But let's start sharing a little bit of our practices and how we encounter the question of sustainability in our practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's have a nice photo to start with. Yes, so this is uh, me under the sofa. And uh, I think that's my uh, starting point where uh, I encountered the uh, feeling and relationship to sustainability. So uh, I think six years ago, more or less, I started questioning what's my artistic voice, what's my artistic pleasure, what do I want to do um, uh, for real? And I found out that my favorite thing to do is nothing. Uh, it was also before Corona time, so I was really overwhelmed and thinking about all the global crisis, it made me feel like, oh my God. Uh, and then if I stop and pause, it's still also so much of happening that I started compared to myself to an object, uh, more specific to a sofa. So I used to say I'm like cozy, cute, comfy, but so heavy and ignorant. So I do believe there are some people who are also like in the question of sustainability, feeling like, oh, I'm relaxed and enjoying my life. But uh, there is this side of uh, ignorance, which is uh, not totally bad, bad. It's also good. <laughs> so we will talk it more. But of course, uh, nothing is not really possible to do. I try to do it. Um, it it's impossible. So this is kind of a circus for me. Um, but uh, later on, I started developing this and I started to have to do something. So I started actually making shows for objects. First sofas, then more objects. Um, and then later on it shifted to uh, uh, animals as well. But uh, I didn't perform for animals. I invited ducks to perform for humans. This is my practice. Cool. Yeah, very cool. Um, I encountered the question of sustainability working with polystyrene because the first... Um, the creation I did is called Materia, and it's an exploration of you this. You can show also your photo. I yeah. can pass the sofa and arrive to polystyrene. So what um, I do is a performance of in between choreography and object manipulation that explores the possibility of this material. But in the process of making this show, I was wasting a lot of polystyrene, which is not a good thing. Um, so the question, what do I do with this waste, came very strongly inside of the creation process. And I started looking for strategies. The first strategy was to start creating some artworks, arguably, with uh, the waste. So in order to perform the show, I need to have perfect shaped polystyrene, uh, as perfect as it can be. It's a beautiful polystyrene. And when it's missing a corner or something like this, unfortunately, it cannot go on stage. The magic wouldn't happen. So these fairly good pieces became these kind of artworks. And um, 
it's a growing uh, series that is sometimes touring in connection with the show. There is an exhibition. The series is called Toxic Landscapes, and I manipulate them, and I paint on them, and I really use the polystyrene as a canvas. And um, we have a brief parenthesis, because Maria and I, actually, first of all, we met in Circo Strada event in Kaunas last year, which is really nice now to be back. Um, but also, Maria made a reformulation of Materia. She made Materia 2.0. It's a very sustainable way to make circus. You recycle someone else's performance. Super sustainable. And it's very cool. Yeah. yeah. So I recently made a film inspired by Andrea's work for polystyrene. So polystyrene is the audience. It's serious. It's really happening, this project. Yes. And this happened thanks to the support of a platform called The Sphere in which we are both uh, inside. And you will hear about it, I think, a little bit later on from, from Ule. Ule. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what did we do? Um, this series of um, artworks grew into kinetic installation and more, and we made an exhibition together uh, recently in Kaunas. Kaunas also. Everything is happening in Kaunas. It's the place to be. Um, here are some uh, pictures. So, yes, as a... Um, Sustainability strategy, this was the first approach that I did. Try to transform the waste into artworks. Was it enough? Clearly not. Uh, we can expand. Yes. Yeah, about practices. Uh, uh, no, yeah. just one second. Polystyrene recycling. Yes. So what I wanted to say is that I had a lot of fragments beyond the semi-good panels. Um, so I went on the best place to find information nowadays, the internet. And on the internet, I found out that there are worms that can eat plastics, specifically polystyrenes. That was really cool. Uh, there were a bunch of kids uh, from high schools in the US doing science projects. They are the best researchers ever. And also some uh, surfboard companies that were using the strategies. So I found out that there are these beautiful, uh, disgusting little thingy that can actually eat polystyrene. And it's super interesting. Um, they are called the uh, Zopobas Mario, commonly known, and you can Google these super worms. Uh, you will find them. And it's actually a very recent thing. The first scientific paper about them came last year in June uh, from the University of Queensland that proves that they can not only process polystyrene, but they can live on a diet based on sole polystyrene, and then they gain mass, so they can really feed out of only polystyrene plus hydration, it's very important hydration. Um, yes, as a, as a little example of how this sustainability question affected my practice and transformed my practice, then I started making a little artwork with this polystyrene. So in this installation we made together, thanks to the support of the sphere, uh, I made a little dollhouse for the worms to be destroyed during the course of the festival. So it was there. They were eating the polystyrene, their, their own little house. And there was a contact microphone, and you could hear them crunch, 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 crunch. And uh, yes, they were also touring with me around in order to get there. So this is how I encountered first the problem. But now, as you were saying, we go a bit more deep into the practices. Yes, very deep into uh, maybe uh, sofas again. Yes, so in this photo, you see how my show functions um, because there are no object festivals and I still really enjoy being with humans and uh, it's my way of surviving as well. I have to go to human festivals. So even though I do it for sofas, people come in and I need to deal with them. Uh, and it's really challenging. It is problematic, the object and the... Uh, human relationship, because if a human is standing next to an object, of course I'm more into a human. But um, it was a challenge for me how to uh, separate it, so I asked people either to uh, go out from the show for uh, 30 minutes, or uh, hide in the room so I can focus, or uh, they should convince me that they are sofas. And most of the people are doing that. And why is it? Uh, it's funny and also uh, bizarre. Uh, but it's very good practice because they try to be an object 
this is a practice I practice myself as well. And then, surprisingly, they really understand what does it mean to be a human. They start questioning what's the real vitality that's hidden in me, because you cannot stop thinking, you cannot stop breathing, you want to pee, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's like uh, very expanding your own understanding who you are. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, this is a show I made uh, for cellos. Uh, this project uh, is also great. Uh, the only sad part was that uh, the producer that helped me to make this work bought all the cellos to be my audience. And it was a big conflict for me because I, I wish that none of my audience would be bought. Uh, if I travel with sofas, then I really want to do it for local sofas of that place. And it's the same with polystyrene. I don't buy polystyrene. I want polystyrene to be from there. And they are just about to be recycled and just before I make the film for them. And um, of course, I don't think that polystyrene and sofas will be very happy receiving my work. I know they ha don't have feelings and etc. Uh, but I do believe that they have some good vibe some good energy, and they feel a level of different respect. Um, yes, and then maybe ducks. Um, uh, so one friend said, Maria, you still uh, have time to do something new. Uh, are you always going to talk to objects? And then said, do a show for humans, please. But I said, uh, well, but non-human topic is very... Uh, very nice. I think it's, uh, it's advancing more and more, and uh, um, I wanted to keep it, so I said, I don't want to perform for humans. I'm not ready. So what can be uh, a performance for humans, but non-humans? So I thought about ducks. It was also the corona times. I was walking around the park, and uh, it happened that I thought, just looking at them, it makes me so much joy. And in circus, we are like losing this relationship to animals. It's becoming illegal, and it makes it, me a bit sad, actually. I saw good shows with nice human and animal relationship, and then if we completely banned it out, it's a bit like, ah, it's good maybe for animals, but it's sad for me. <laughs> <laughs> so if I don't manipulate ducks, I don't try to change their environment, I just Still, I st sit still like a sofa, and they look at them, I observe, I listen, I try to learn from them. It's beautiful. So this is how the show works. Like we do a little education lecture for people, and then we are teaching them how to look at life and things and object, notice, and then we go to the park and people are sitting and watching ducks. It takes two hours, so we are well, very welcome. Like, with lecture, not just watching ducks. <laughs> yeah. uh, what about your practice? Just a little ah. bit about um, your strategies, because in all of yes. this work, there are very clear strategies. So. Oh, good, you reminded me. Yes. So my strategies are that it's very paradoxical. So I really like to stay uh, passive and do nothing, but on the other side, I really uh, feel pleasure to look for this vitality and let's, let's bring more life. So I do this or that. I don't like in the middle. Um, another strategy is that I really, as I mentioned, I try to be an object from time to time. Like, uh, for example, I tried being a sofa, then being a human, then being half-half, and then reflecting. It's very recommended because you understand so much about... Uh, uh, how much imagination trying to understand what does it mean to be a thing it brings. I think the level of creativity is hidden in there. Uh, and the, another very important thing is like um, trying to get out from anthropocentric uh, approach. This is actually what we can expand on um, human and object relationship. I just it's find super fascinating about while trying to be something else than yourself, it's like the question of what is your, my, the difference between me and a sofa. It, as silly as it sounds, as strong as it is, it's really nice. And then there is this level of noticing and looking 
and um, really about rethinking our perception of objects. That is really where our practices, as different as they are, we yes. really meet. And I think that the bigger takeaway that we would like to give out of this little talk is really about trying to stress the focus on our perception of the object uh, environment in which we are immersed and that we are trying to rethink somehow in different ways. You want to tell about your... Uh... Yes. Um, there was a last slide about uh, Maria and Polystyrene. Uh, this is me trying to be polystyrene, uh, taking care of a vacuum cleaner. Perfect. And a film of Materia 2.0. <laughs> so, you know, in the best cinemas. Um, okay, my practice. So, I work with objects. At some point uh, during my transition from juggling towards dance and choreography, I started uh, working not anymore with codified circus props, and I started uh, being very interested in common objects. Um, so my practice would be to go to a studio completely empty-ended, see what we find them, what I would have found there, and there are always objects, more objects that you think around yourself. And uh, yes, and then I would start playing with these objects. And what I would train is basically not trying to find tricks, not trying to develop my own skill and trying to be amazing in displaying this and that, but trying to train my creativity. Because we are born with um, amazing skill of looking at the world with a very curious eyes. Uh, we were uh, talking about Ula, the baby, the other day having a 20 minutes investigation of a chair, it was fantastic. It was the peak of our both practices. This is the core. Professor for me now, how to observe objects. But really, and the more we grow into adulthood, the more we become functional human being, the more we know how to use things, but also we lose the capacity to investigate them. And so defamiliarization as a technique to apply to objects in order to develop a language with each object and then try to build a dialogue. This is really where my practice grows. Can, can I quickly add, uh, just sure. not to lose? I, I noticed the same issue that uh, uh, when we are in connection, what's the problematic between human and object? Uh, when I started to work with sofas, people would ask me, but do they like your show? Do they pay for tickets? Uh, how they react when you do this. So what it means, it means that we immediately put our human perception that the object is kind of me type of thing. And then we don't notice what real qualities the object has. What does it mean to be a sofa for a sofa as a sofa, not a sofa human? And I think it's a big, big difference uh, to be aware of. Um, yeah, and the real problem with our relationship with objects and the unsustainable part of our relationship with objects is how we perceive and interact with them. That it's very often a use and dispose kind of um, relationship. This is why I made a, a show with polystyrene, like trying to look at differently to something that is usually, you, you take it out of the box, you take the goods out of the polystyrene and you trash the polystyrene away. You go to La Villette, that you get your little picnic box, and then there are these boxes of polystyrene flying around. But then we're very well taken care of for. But yes, this is, this is the concept. So how can we look, how can we put a spotlight on this and look at this thing that we usually don't look at as important and we see it very disposable uh, in a different way? Can we mention what we discovered yesterday about your practice to, to look for different affordances for the object. Yeah, I was, I yeah. was getting to that. Mm -hmm. So um, what I do is trying to, um, yes, discover objects. I started working specifically with uh, discarded uh, objects. Uh, and whenever I go to teach a workshop, I ask the presenter that uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, facilitating the workshop to collect trash, basically. Uh, this happens with, um, Scrapyard, this happens through second-hand shops. They have always something that they cannot sell anymore for long months and they collect. And sometimes this grows into uh, shows. So here is an example. Um, I was at the uh, SAC, Seoul Street Art uh, Creation Center. Uh, I made a project together with a company 
from Seoul called the Chorosco. We gathered a lot of uh, originally trash, but then performative objects uh, from the street of Seoul, and we made uh, a show together. Uh, this happened in 2021 with the support of Art Council of Korea. It was really, really beautiful. And um, yes, this was an example of this practice of mine that is looking for, yes, affordances for objects, where usually we perceive object, we look at object with two main categories in mind. One being their designed function, and the second one being their economical value. And often we flatten object to these two parameters. Polystyrene as a very quickly exhausted function, as we mentioned before, once it's out of the package, it's done, single use uh, material. And the second one is uh, very low economical value. It doesn't cost much, I can throw it away, I can buy something new. And we, this, this perception really affects the way we interact with things. I have my phone here and a glass of water, one is not worth as much as the other. I don't relate, I don't take care of, I don't invest. It's a completely different relationship. And this goes on your daily life. But I found it beautiful uh, how we discussed yesterday that rethinking what else this object could afford prolongs the lifetime of that thing. If you stop using the cup, as a cup, maybe it can be a pot for your plant, and maybe later on something else, something else. So this is very beautiful sustainability um, possibility. Yes, these are uh, a couple of pictures from the workshop. Um, there are different exercises and different strategies how to engage in a dialogue with objects and uh, how to reinvent objects. But as you were saying, finding affordances, trying to look things that are familiar in an unfamiliar ways, it's really my strategy is to try to change our perception, whereas you have a different ways to somewhat get close to the same goal. Yeah, I go even more radical. For example, I did a, a workshop for sofas only. People had to come, but it was badly organized, so I asked just sofas to be in the room. And for five days, I would start like with warming up so I warm up my own body, and sofa can't warm up itself. So I would do a massage for a sofa, and then we do contact improvisation together. And then I was very excited. I started to tell to people I'm doing this. Then some dancers said, oh, can I come for this workshop? I say, but you are not a sofa, but if you want to do something for sofa, please do. And then in five days, we started rolling around, putting sofas on the head and being in very intimate relationship understanding your own body and the sofa and um... this sounds very funny but it's a very de anthropocentric practice and the anthropocentrism the core of it is the idea of subjective transformation the idea that we can be affected by object as much as we affect object that the hierarchy somehow flattens and uh, can be reversed even so if we st stop thinking of ourselves as being able to use and dispose of everything, and we start thinking of um, our role in the midst of it and how we relate with the different things that we are constantly surrounded by, this is, magic can happen. Things suddenly are beautiful, are super interesting, and you can have a 20 minutes amazement mo um, amusement moment with a chair. Yes, but it's, it's hard, like we, I would definitely invite you to try this out, but it is not easy. I would say more than 20 minutes, it might get boring. I try to talk to sofas and perform for them, and then, no, oh, I want something else. So it's also good not to overjudge ourselves, but we are still humans, and it's impossible to climb out from your own only human perception. So what I do in these pessimistic moments when I'm like, oh, I cannot understand objects, even if I try, or animals, then I'm just saying, it's okay, Maria, just have fun. Just do whatever you want to do. Objects will not judge you. They will still be in your show because you will bring them in. They cannot run away. So it just really liberates you. So during Corona times, when everybody was stuck in their houses, I did a workshop online for all the artists who cannot go to perform for humans. 
and they said, come on, go to your room and perform for your objects in the house, for your kitchen, for your whatever. And uh, yeah, people got inspired and uh, had fun with it. Fantastic. So we are not done yet. We yeah, have four minutes. a mm -hmm. very TED Talk uh, professional exercise that we would like to share with you. So next slide, please. Investigation time. What we would like you to do, we would like you to find an object, preferably something that belongs to you. You are full of objects. I am using object now to communicate with you. I have object on myself. Just find something that it belongs to you. And, and we are going to, sorry. Yeah, and, and then we would invite you for one minute. Yeah, one or two. Can we do one two? Minute. One. One and a half. One and a half minutes. One and a half minutes. Sold to Maria. We invite you just to look at the thing, um, keep silent, keep exploring, and uh, and uh, we with Andrea we give one object for each other as well. Yes, but for you it's best you you find something that belongs to you, and you will find out how alien this thing is. We just ask you for this minute and a half to keep your curiosity high, not to finish it, not to exhaust it. Like don't close the painting. Imagine you are a uh, a, a newborn, and you're discovering this thing for the first time, trying to get out of the Go first baby bubble. style. Baby Do you have a, an object for me? I have an object. I, I thought we will be sitting on a sofa, so I wanted to go uh, with a sofa, but I don't have a big one, so I have a very small from my pocket. That's perfect. Thank yes. you. This is for you. Oh, thank you. Um, do you have an object? Yes, fantastic. Then, for one minute and a half, in silent, don't get too excited, don't share it yet with your um, neighbors. We do this. We ready? We start. can see here now all people around staring at one object in silence on the screen it is called the investigation time and at the invitation of Maria and Andrea we have one minute to stare at an object and I'm staring myself at the microphone, of course. It's a very silent moment. We can see people staring at their phone, bottle of water. Let me see more. Paper. I can see a ring. playing the game. Small box. I so see. much. And we are done. Thank you very much. And yeah, no, we no, no, decided... No, no. Uh, we are done with the exercise. We are not done with the lecture because we have <laughs> homeworks for you. Yeah, we decided we don't share any of this experience. You can share afterwards with your ah, okay. neighbors. But let's, let's go to the homework right yes, away. Yes, homework. So, to homework. First homework, you can do the same thing with something that is in the way to your house. It could be a tree, it could be a lamppost, it could be a graffiti on the wall. If you stop for the first time, 30 seconds homework, 30 seconds, to explore this in the same way, you will never be able to see that thing the same way again. You will always notice it when you go back home. It happens. So please do this homework, only 30 seconds. And if you want to go more radical, uh, try to be an object for two hours. If you need help, call me. I will explain how to do it. So thank you for listening to us. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Maria and Andrea. So we have a 10 minute break now. You can get up and get out if you want. And we come back in 10 minutes, right? Thank you. It is 25 past 11 local time here in Paris. <laughs> Pelouse, Reuilly, Village de Cirque. You are listening to Fresh Wave Radio Station streaming live the event and the artistic talk just right now. <laughs> We could think of an object to be in relationship with an object being a sofa. And as you know, in this event, there are performing performances in the afternoon. And, um, and this is why I invited Fabrice Guillot from the Compagnie Retour à Mont, mm -hmm. who does with the city like they ask to do with the object. And I wanted uh, to invite you, Fabrice, because um, your company does outdoor performance, vertical mm -hmm. performance, and since one year is used to perform in the new circus place, new mm -hmm. outdoor place here in Paris, which is called Rue Watt, Street Watt. So I wanted to know first, how does it look, this specific place in Paris, the Rue Watt, where this afternoon you will be performing again? This Rue Watt, it's uh, quite uh, strange and funny because uh, it's nearly invisible. When you arrive on the square, you, you see nothing. A flat square, and on this flat square you have some railings. And when you watch under, there is a hole, like a canyon, a urban canyon. And uh, in this urban canyon you have uh, the Rue Watt, this is uh, the name of the street. Uh, then you need to take uh, the stairs to go to, go to, that, to that place. And you can come into this creation uh, on the pedagogic uh, space. It's a really interesting uh, laboratory. Then it's uh, when you are in the street, you have some walls, 12 meters high. And up there you have the square. And up the square you have some buildings. Then it's a multi-level uh, multi uh, space. And... Um, There is some studios of creations, and we made uh, we made a, a crea first time of creation in that space in the wall. Then we were dancing on the walls, and we the um, the journey, the, the movement of the dancer uh, was doing some draws on the fresh paint. Then uh, it's uh, it will stay there for a moment, and we began also to uh, explore with. Uh, with students of the university, because there is a university uh, just uh, in the same street with a st dance studio. Yeah, we have to say that this street is located in the 13th arrondissement of Paris, yes. which is very close to the new library, la, la, la Bibliothèque yeah. François Mitterrand. It's a new, uh, it's an old area that was re-urbanized in a way. Absolutely with uh, new buildings. Uh, uh, there is this uh, University of Tolbiac, very next to it. The river is not so far away. Yeah. And it's uh, in the south of, of Paris. So <laughs> just look to see. The 13th location. arrondissement, uh, mm. very nice and very lively uh, area. Absolutely. And, uh, with a lot also of Chinese uh, so, uh, community of uh, restaurants. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had many experiences now uh, in, the, in that space. And I like to imagine that the, the place where our work is like an apparatus. Uh, it's exactly if uh, I, I begin the, an exploration of the space and the creation space has some pillars, mm -hmm. some truss at the vertical. There is some truss on the roof. It's possible to hang. Uh, we can dance on the wall, we can dance in the void also. Then we are not using only the surface on the ground, but you are using that space in the three dimensions completely because it's possible to hang everywhere. 
it's possible to climb in the truss, uh, to go into the truss also in the little, uh, in a really little uh, space. And, uh, and we began this exploration with students of uh, different levels, some beginners, some... Uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's a spectacular place, but it's not so easy to take uh, the space in this place. Oh, how, how do you look at it? Naturally, you, how do you look to a place like that when you first arrive and say, okay, mm -hmm. I will perform? Uh, where is the first look? For my practice, it's, it's really easy to imagine something in that space. And it was really interesting, the process we had in that uh, studio. It's, uh, we began the creation, the research of the creation on the wall. Uh, and a uh, few months after, we came again, but we opened the door and we went on the wall of the real street because th that wall is higher and it's, it was really interesting to have a first exploration with a, a low level, 8 meters high, and now we are outside with a 13 meter high, meters high. And uh, we continue the creation for weeks on, the, on, on that wall and it's interesting for a, a space with open to street art to uh, it's a kind of laboratory we can begin to explore to imagine some process some uh, some movements and after that it's open to the streets yes it's open to the square up there it's open to the district yeah but what is difficult when you do open air in the city we can imagine there is electricity there is cars buses people how do you work with the life inside the city while you work in, in this place? Uh, I, made, I made this choice to, uh, to do the creations, all the, nearly all the time of creation, we do, the, we do the times uh, outside in the city uh, in order of, uh, yeah, with no specific uh, organization. And uh, it's a surprise for people who are, because when you have a show, you have a, a meeting, uh, you know at what time it will begin, but us, we, are, we have some weeks and uh, nobody knows what we are doing and some people are stopping, are asking, uh, and it's always interesting to, uh, to create a kind of... Uh, um, surprise. Yeah, surprise completely, so with uh, a piece of art in a... Uh, we, 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 at the beginning, it's, uh, we, we start, we imagine the vocabulary, and uh, step by step, we arrive to the creation, and we made the premiere, uh, the 2 of September, on the wall, just in front of uh, Rue Watt. And tell us a bit more about what is happening this afternoon in the Rue Watt. So we see it's a street, what, but it's not only a street, it's also a wall, it's, it's underneath, it's a, so it's, it's a complex, as you say, uh, like a geometric, geometrical uh, space. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a work about horizontality of pedestrian uh, space and verticality. And there is a, there is a limit. There is a border between the horizontal and the vertical uh, element of the street. And I imagine that uh, this limit doesn't exist anymore for my dancer because she can walk on the ground walk on the wall with absolutely no difference, no border, then it's, uh, it's a way to say that we can uh, forget some limits we have, like a pedestrian, or, uh, like a citizen in the, in the city. And it's interesting to, yeah, to imagine that the, the borders, the limits, the interdictions can uh, disappear sometimes. Yeah, it's a metaphor of uh, to go behind the borders to go behind. Uh, you, you, you have already 20 years of a company, uh, Fabrice uh, uh, Guillot. Tell us some uh, of uh, amazing or strange or different places you went to perform uh, all around the world. Mm. Last week we, have, uh, we had a, an extreme experience uh, in the Mont Saint-Michel. It, uh, it was incredible because we uh, we propose to the audience to stay in front of the little mountains of the little mountain of the Mont Saint Michel, and the, the, the objective it was to um, 
to have this proposition to uh, to inhabit from the the flesh from the highest point of the Mont Saint Michel, and to be up the, the audience sometime really near of the audience, and how is it, it was it's possible to inhabit completely this mountain with only eight dancers, but uh, it was possible because we work at night and we have also some repertory, some uh, process with uh, video, with uh, big shadows, and uh, with our ropes, we, uh, we had the possibility to, uh, to put some new journey, new, uh, new lines, uh, two uh, new trails in the void to go from the highest point to the, to the place where is the audience. And uh, it was one of the biggest and the more complex uh, space we, we never uh, practiced. practiced before. And abroad, in a foreign country, where, is there a place where you would like to, to go and, and dance? Because you, you try to dance into the sky in a way, into, towards the sky also. Maybe, I don't know if it's the ultimate destiny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is our future anyway. <laughs> I like to imagine some uh, apparatus. Then some apparatus are, are fixed on the wall. Some of them can be hanged in the, in the, in the void because it's uh, the vertical dance. We, uh, we imagine uh, more the walking on a wall, uh, dancing on a wall. But uh, we are, the company exists since uh, 35 years. Oh, yeah, I said 20, but because you, you look <laughs> young. <laughs> And uh, for, for a long time, we, we danced on the walls, and I, I had a kind of frustration to not inhabit the void. Then we begin to put some ropes between two buildings. And uh, after, I began to imagine some apparatus to, uh, to inhabit the void. And we, the first of, uh, of them was uh, a pyramid of rope with only four ropes. But uh, it was um, occupied by three artists. Inside that uh, big pyramid, uh, it's, it goes at 20 meters high, and we uh, we hang that pyramid in many countries, uh, all the continents, and uh, it was a beautiful exploration of the void. We made that in uh, industrial spaces, in uh, in the fields uh, near the sea, in the mountain, uh, in the center of many cities. And each time, uh, this apparatus is completely transparent. Then it's like if you put a slide. Uh, then you see the action, but you can see completely the city uh, through it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is it um, uh, difficult to do this work in the city? Do you have the authorization? Is it easy to invest uh, the the city when you do uh, this uh, kind of artistic uh, movement uh, in the buildings? In fact, for us, it's really easy. I say it's easy, but it's it's a lot of work. But we we have the we have the knowledge just to uh, to organize that. For example, for the Mont Saint Michel, we play also in the Bibliothèque François Mitterrand. Then we made a show with 14 people. It was a European uh, a meeting of vertical dance. We began in Rue Watt uh, with uh, students of the university, and after we went step by step to the Bibliothèque François Mitterrand, and. Uh, Then we, we know how to speak to the owners, to the people who are uh, working on safety. Then uh, we, for us, we are like, uh, like some workers, like uh, we, uh, we have a, a process. Uh, it's like if we are doing some paint on the wall or something, then uh, the people in front of us, they understand our vocabulary. And we imagine together some process on uh, okay for about safety, about uh, public protection, on everything, about the protection of the site so also because when we are working on old uh, old buildings, but the new ones they are not made for vertical dance. Then we we need each time to imagine uh, yes. our anchors. Yes, because it's often uh, only glasses without a uh, way to put your, your feet or your hand. Yeah, the city has changed and the city is not made to be climbed <laughs> on now. Yeah, it's, This is what you observe. Yeah, it's completely uh, incredible because it's... Uh, with this practice, we, uh, we cross all the limits, all the borders. There is absolutely no limit. I have a friend architect who is saying that the, 
the only limit for the vertical dance is the distance where we can see. Because we can do what we want. And uh, it's funny because the owners and the, the city uh, mayor and everybody ask us to do some impossible things. Yeah, and what is your favorite city to, to do your work, your artistic work? Uh, I, I'm really happy sometimes to work on the really invisible sites. For example, we made an enormous project with 20 artists in, uh, on the pillars of a motorway in uh, Saint-Denis. And Which it, is in the northern part of Paris. Yeah, it's, it's, it was... It's the uh, city where there is a cathedral Saint-Denis. Yes, exactly, but... Uh, It was uh, for a meeting about architecture and, uh, and the people uh, said after when they saw the show on that pillar of the motorway, we were under the motorway and they said, oh, it's a cathedral for dancing. It's, uh, it's so, uh, so, it seems to be made for then uh, we will do some shows here uh, later. And I like also to work, of course, on uh, beautiful spaces like Mont Saint-Michel. But both are really interesting. It's uh, this notion of uh, the relation we have to the city, for me, is quite complex. Uh, and we spend some time with that pillars, with the different objects. We are touching them. We are spending time in the void between. And we, uh, we begin to inhabit and to, uh, to have a, um, a strong relation to that space. And we finish to love it, really. And we have some, um, well, we are kind with that matter and we bring some uh, softness or some, uh, something really sweet with a strong EV uh, uh, object uh, of the architecture. Is it dangerous? Did you have any accident? Never. Never? Ah, oh, good. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's for that reason I have some uh, white hairs. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, because I'm you always have... afraid about uh, the safety, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah. not easy. But uh, After 30, more than 30 years, you're still uh, scared. Yeah, absolutely, but uh, at, the, at the base I am a climber. Then uh, the risk in uh, mountaineering or climbing, they are, even if you are the good material, you have to take care on... And, uh, What is more, most risky, to climb on the mountains or to climb on, on the buildings? On the mountain, because you have many, many risks you can't uh, imagine. And uh, I, I'm more uh, a bouldering uh, climber on a cliff climber than in mountain. It's For me, it's too dangerous. And uh, in the city, we are obliged to take care about many, many... Things, you can control yeah, it. And when weather is bad weather, you don't, you don't climb or do you do, uh, do, you, do you do your artistic show? Yeah, yeah yes. absolutely. I use the material. My uh, technical director is an architect and he's also a climber. And then we have multi... Uh, Skills. Yeah, multi knowledges about uh, construction, about the, the rules, about the material and the... And we, we, we think always to the safety, but my uh, technical director, Olivier Penel, is not afraid. He ah. sleeps well, <laughs> me no. <laughs> He's a lucky man. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> What would be your dream? Excuse me? What would be your dream, like a uh, next big project or maybe small project? Yeah. I'm really happy to, uh, to, to, uh, to do this creation we just made, this solo. For me, it's uh, nearly uh, synthetic about uh, the, the, the name of the company. It's uh, Retour à Mont. And with this solo, it's like if we can give the image of... Uh, we can go into the vertical direction, we can uh, be taken, something like this. Like if uh, gravity sometimes doesn't exist, sometimes it's, you come back to the ground because the ground is really... Present and I think that verticality, it's uh, from the hull to the, to the stars. It's uh, what said uh, a poet, uh, Roberto Juajos, for, for him, the verticality is from the, the hull to the, to the star. Okay, and we try to inhabit this, uh, we need the gravity to go down and uh, sometimes uh, 
the gravity perhaps doesn't exist. We are taken by a spiral, I don't know what, of energy. We can, we can go, uh, go up. And perhaps uh, we saw that in the Mont Saint-Michel, we, uh, we made the reality about the, the dream of the, the ice of the tourists who are watching to the, to the Archange at the top of the Mont Saint-Michel. Uh, and uh, with our ropes, it's possible to do this uh, journey of uh, verticality that uh, everybody has this dream to, uh, to go uh, further, to, to jump on the wall, to uh, inhabit the void. Uh. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Let's go back to the ground now. Absolutely. <laughs> for the, the last part of the morning session. Thank you very much, Fabrice Guillot, Compagnie Retour à Mont, talking about Ruat, Mont Saint-Michel, Saint-Denis, and all these, these places. Back to the morning session. We are streaming now this morning of fresh. It's the last round table that will happen now. It's a, a one hour, one hour and a half round table with five panelists. Everybody.